The fact that Jesus washed his disciples' feet is known far beyond Christian circles. In fact, probably everybody in the world who knows anything about Jesus or has ever heard anything about Jesus knows that Jesus, during the Passover night before he was betrayed, washed his disciples' feet. Unfortunately, familiarity with that knowledge is probably what prevents people from understanding what he really meant and what was really going on when he washed his disciples' feet because people think that they know what's going on. They don't dive deeply into it. It's because we read the gospel so often like a bag of marbles. We pull it out of the a bag, this shiny, beautiful little marble, and we look at one incident where Jesus turned wine to or water to wine at the wedding at Cana in Galilee, or he healed a blind man's eyes. And so we look at those individual stories, and if we are blind, we ask questions like, could he make me see? Or if he was at my wedding, could he turn it into the joyous thing that I hoped that it would be when I was growing up anticipating it? But I want to I look at, at John's gospel, not only this week, but the following week and the week of Easter, and then even after the following of that, to kind of tie this whole section of John's gospel together to draw you in to what the Apostle John really, really, really wants to show us. And so if you are any kind of a Bible student and you have ever read the gospel of John, the first 12 chapters are known by so many people as the book of signs. The book of signs was given so that we believe. And so the particular signs that Jesus gave in, or that John gave that Jesus did in the beginning of John's gospel were that he did turn water into wine at the wedding at Cana in Galilee. He also healed a, a royal official's son. He walked on water. He fed 5,000 people. He healed a paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. He healed a blind man's eyes, and then the seventh of those signs was that he raised Lazarus from the dead. John presents all of those signs to you so that you will believe. And belief, in a sense, is for outsiders. I'm, I'm giving you this evidence so that you would believe that Jesus has been sent from God and that by believing it in Jesus, you would have life in his name. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to just flip back a page from John chapter 13 into John chapters 12, and I will show you how John is ending his book of signs with this idea that you should believe. It says in verse 36, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and he hid himself from them. So we get this indicator that Jesus is hidden from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then it goes down in verse 39, therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and he has hardened their hearts. So John is ending this section of his gospel talking about a large number of people who encountered Jesus who did not believe. And then Jesus hid himself after he had said those things. In verse 44, it says, And Jesus cried out loud and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my word and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Just a little footnote here. The word that Jesus spoke was the word that Moses spoke. So he said earlier in the gospel, the reason you don't understand who I am is because you don't believe what, what Moses said. And I know that his commandment is eternal life, or I'm sorry, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So now, what John has done is he has shaped his gospel up to this point 
to bring you to what theologians call a crisis of belief. You're standing on the precipice. You either have to jump or not jump. You try to save yourself by your own works and the good things that you have done, or you trust Jesus as the Messiah that God has sent. And then, in chapter 13, John takes a completely different bent, and he goes into what theologians call the book of glory. This is now, I'm going to show you the glory of Jesus. I'm going to show you, having seen that he could heal a blind man's eyes, I'm going to show you, you having seen that he could feed 5,000 in the wilderness, to show you that he having turned water into wine, what Jesus can do. I want to show you in the most intimate terms, what is God's greatest glory? And so chapter 13 to the end of the book is about Jesus's glory. So we pick up these words. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going back from God, rose from supper. Now, what happens here? is really, really interesting because there's four time markers. It was the Passover feast. It was during supper. It had been put in Judas's heart to betray him, but more importantly, this is now the hour of Christ's glory. Now you get to see who he really, really is. And so he arose from supper. Look at the details in the text in front of you. He laid aside his outer garments. It's like you can see it as you read it. He girded himself about with a towel. He took a basin and he poured water in it. And he knelt down at his disciples' feet and he began to wash them. This is the glory of your God. Everybody is waiting for a king to deliver. Everybody is waiting for a king to rule. And now God is inviting you into the most intimate part of his soul. Our God is a servant. It shocked his disciples. It shocked his disciples so much that Peter had to speak up. And and the English translation doesn't even capture for us um, Peter's abrupt objection. He literally said, you, me, wash the feet? I mean, mean, he didn't even say a complete sentence. As, As Jesus came by Peter with a towel, Peter objects because Jesus is the Lord. Because Jesus is a king. Because Jesus is God. Because Jesus rules the universe. And I think we know at the back of our minds that if our ruler washes feet, we have to also. that if our king washes feet, we have to do the same. So I would rather keep Jesus as a king only because then I can be a king too. Because then I can, in my obedience to God, rule something. If I am good in his kingdom, then I will be given a city or cities or a nation to rule. But oh my gosh, if Jesus washes feet, then I have to be a foot washer. And Peter objects. I I think we all know it. What 
John, I believe, is trying to do is draw the followers of Jesus into an understanding of God's true heart. Do any of us really understand the cross? Why would one who is so sinless, perfect, never had done anything wrong, blameless, pure in all of his motives, die for a wretch like me? I mean, Paul said in Romans, for a good cause, or possibly for a good man, someone would die. But die for their country to keep their freedoms free. But to die for enemies? This is our God. This is Yahweh who created the universe. You know, I I just want to take one exception to one line in one of the songs we sung this morning. The Father did not look down upon us with a righteous frown. Our Father was not frowning. Our Father sent the Son because he's a servant. The Son of God is a servant. The Holy Spirit is a servant. God is here today not only to rule you, but to wash your feet, to cleanse you to make you new, to care for you, to redeem you, to draw you in, to love you, to hold you, to carry you into eternity. And so there's Jesus on his knees, washing his disciples' feet with a towel wrapped around him. Now, now everybody knows, probably if you grew up in church, you've heard this story told over and over and over that in the Jewish community, they didn't even consider this, they, they considered this such a mundane task that they wouldn't allow Jewish slaves. Now, we're not talking about American chattel slavery. We're talking about people who had to go back essentially what was into indentured servitude because they had been in debt and they couldn't pay their debts off. So they had to sell themselves into slavery and they had to serve their countrymen, their fellow Jewish people as slaves until their debts were paid off and the rabbis had come up and said, uh, if you have a Jewish slave, you cannot require him to wash your feet. So that's too lowly of a tax. So everybody would have recognized that what Jesus was doing was choosing what the rabbis had decided upon and stepping one step past it, like he always did in his ministry. The rabbis would make a decision and Jesus would say, I don't think that's what the word of God meant. And so now Jesus is making himself, this isn't, there's ways you can humiliate yourself far worse than, than washing someone's feet. But this is a socially acceptable, understood action that the Jewish people would say, it would be okay if a Gentile washed your feet. If you had a Gentile who was a slave, he could wash your feet, but not, but not a Jew. And so Jesus as the Jew, right? Can we say Jesus as the Jew, (laughs) the Messiah, washes the feet of his disciples? And Peter objects. And Jesus answered him and said, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterward you will understand. So (laughs) Peter says, well, you'll never wash my feet. Well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no share with me. You you hear what Jesus said. If you don't accept me as a God who's a servant, you have the wrong God. You have the wrong conception of God. You have no part in my kingdom. Because in my kingdom, there shall be an army of servants. Not an army of rulers, an army of servants. An army of humble people. An army of gentle people an army of lambs who are led to the slaughter all day long. I read a quote from Charles Spurgeon this week that said, why do you seek glory in the world that crucified your Savior? Why do you seek ascendancy in the world that cast down your Savior into the dirt? Why do you seek honor 
from a place that stabbed a spear into Jesus' side. Get on your knees and wash someone's feet. Because if you don't, you have no share with them. Now, Peter, not understanding what Jesus said, thinking it was only an external thing, well, then wash my hands and my head. If I don't have any share, I mean, you love the exuberance, right? Well, I don't want just feet then. Take all of me. I think at that moment, Jesus would have chuckled. If you can look up at the, at the picture that I, I've chosen for the sermon today, Peter's face is a little bit contorted while Jesus is washing his feet. I don't think G Peter's face was contorted while Jesus is washing his feet because if you read the text carefully, he goes, well, then my hand's in my head. And I think Jesus got a smile. And he says, no, that's going to be good. We'll just wash your feet. Now, why would he say hands and head? Because that would have been the parts of his body that was exposed, right? Peter didn't have his shirt taken off. He didn't say, give me a whole bath. And so probably what, what's going on here is if you're going to Passover dinner, you've had a bath already. It was their feet that were dirty. And Jesus is washing his feet because normally a servant or somebody would have been at the door to wash their feet, or there was a complimentary bowl for people to wash their own feet, and none of them had done it when they went in. And so now Jesus, seeing the opportunity, starts washing their feet to show them that he's a servant, and then he puts the towel back on, he takes aside his garments that he's laid aside, he puts down, he lays back down, he reclines at the table again, and he says, oh yeah, well, if you call me teacher, and you call me Lord, that hasn't changed. I am those things. He literally said, ego me, the great I am statements of John. He goes, yeah, I am that thing, but if I did that for you, then you have to do it for, read it yourself, not me. You do it for one another. See, I would suspect that if Jesus were here today, that maybe you reluctantly, like Peter, would let him wash your feet. And in kind, you would wash Jesus' feet. But would you wash one another's feet? That's the question. What's interesting to me is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't record this story. I think Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote their Gospels before John wrote his Gospel. John was a pastor. What John left out here was communion. John doesn't talk anything about communion on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. I think everybody understood that they had been practicing communion for decades by the time John wrote his gospel. They had meeting, re met regularly for meals in one another's homes. The book of Acts records this, that they dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. And the breaking of bread would have been eating together. They regularly ate meals with one another. But there was a level of Christian intimacy that was lacking in the church. And so I think when John wrote his gospel, he took the opportunity to say, I don't think all of you have grasped yet what it means to follow the Savior. Because are you washing one another's feet? Now, this is a, not a literal thing that we're being asked to do. Because he said, I did it as an example. See, in their culture, they understood what that meant. I racked my brains for the last two or three weeks trying to figure out, was there anything in our culture that mimicked or mirrored the washing of feet so I could just say it and you would understand it? And I can't think of one. Carl and I went and got a massage the other day. So we paid to go get a massage. It was really nice. It was comfortable. And as a lady was massaging me, I was thinking, is this like getting my feet washed? But then I no, because she chose to go into that profession. She, she trained to be a masseuse. I, I assume she likes her job. I don't think anybody likes being relegated to washing people's feet. 
being given that task. No child grows up and says, when I'm older, I want to be a foot washer. That's my goal in life. You know, a fireman. Remember that when we were younger? I, like, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a police officer. I'm going to be a nurse. Those were the big three when I was a kid, right? But foot washer, who dreams that? That's not anybody's dream. And here's Jesus of Nazareth going, I have shown you my glory. See, this is part of his glory. See, there in the text, it says he loved them to the end. Look in that verse, it says, and he loved them to the end. That's verse one. The Greek word is telos. It doesn't mean to a terminus point. Um, the Greeks would say if a horse was, was a good horse, it had achieved its telos by being a good horse. It, it had achieved its purpose, its identity, what it was created for. So if you see a bird flying, you go, oh, yes, that's the telos of a bird to fly because birds fly and fish swim and, and what do humans do? Well, you read back in Genesis 1 and 2, humans are given the dignity of ruling over the creation in partnership with God and treating one another as image bearers of God and reflecting his great glory and, and being like their creator because they're their creator's representative on the earth. And so now to Jesus is saying, or what John is saying about Jesus is he loved them to the end. He loved them with the fullness of purpose. He, he showed us what humanity should be, that what God always designed and intended it to be was servants of one another. That same word he will say on the cross when he said, it is finished, it's the Greek version of the noun telos. It's tetelestai. He will say, I have finally showed you what it means to be a servant. To give your life in exchange for another. With no promised benefit for you. With no anticipated benefit for you. With no outcome for you that's going to be positive, that you would just serve another human being because you see in them the great glory of God's image in them. That's what it means to be human. That's what it means to be an image bearer of God. And Jesus says, the one who has bathed does not need to wash in response to Peter except for his feet, but is completely but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. Now, wait a minute. Judas was sitting there, and he just washed his feet. And we're assuming Judas would have taken a bath. So why is Judas not clean? So Jesus must be talking about something beyond physical. For he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. So if you flip to the passage I'm going to preach next week in John 15, it says, already, verse 3, you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. See, that, that sense of belief, that sense of putting your trust in God as Savior is when the blood of Jesus washes you from sin. But just accepting Jesus as Savior and being washed from sin could be understood from having the motive to just deliver yourself. Oh, yes, I would like to be delivered from eternal punishment, but I don't want to be delivered into a world where I'm called to be a servant. That's what John chapter 13 is about. You are being delivered into a world of servants. You're being delivered into a whole eternity of people serving one another. Start now. Your belief that this is the kingdom that God is bringing is by taking actions now. And you know what? It brings more, in my opinion, glory to God to do that now, given all the temptations that we have, than then, because then we will be made perfect. Then we will not have wrong motives or desires. Now you fight wrong motive and desire. Now you fight the, the capacity to betray Jesus. 
Now you live in a world that tells you to exalt and to ascend yourself. But when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments, resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If then I am your Lord and teacher, I've washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you, just as I have done to you. You know, at the end of our service, we always say, send us into the world as you have sent your son into the world. Those words aren't fluff. Those words reflect an understanding of the gospel of what Jesus has done for us. So I want to walk out that door doing for this world what Jesus would have done had he been here with us and walked out that door. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Not blessed are you if you can recall it on a test. Not blessed are you if you know that that's written in John chapter 13. The blessing comes, and the interesting thing here is the blessing comes to those. The concept is not something external coming upon you. It's that your heart finally realizes what it was made for. What truly makes you happy is being a servant. Now, as I look at the tree, and it looks desirous to make me wise, and I want to pluck the fruit from the tree, and I want to defy the words of God, and I hear the words of God that says, you will be happy if you become a servant of others, that doesn't seem like a good option, does it? That seems like a lie. But is the Savior a liar? The Savior has said, you will be happy if you live this way. The Savior said, this is where your blessing comes from if you live this way. The Savior would say, I know people are going to take advantage of you if you live this way. I know people are going to stab you in the back if you live this way. I know that you're going to feel like you're losing in this world if you live this way, but you'll be happy. You'll be way happier than those people who are scrounging with greed to always get more who never have enough. It's interesting to me, Jesus says, yeah, you don't understand what I just said to you. You'll know later. See, but here's the deal. You and I know later. The disciples didn't because they had no idea what the next 24 hours were going to transpire to be. They had no idea that they were going to betray Jesus. They had no idea that he was going to be handed over to the Romans. They had no idea he was going to have a bloody uh, death on a cross. They had no idea that when he said it is finished on the cross, they would look back to that moment and go, oh my gosh, that's what he was talking about. Wow. And he's in complete control because he knew who he would betray him. He wasn't deceived into the moment. The moment didn't take something from him. He wasn't washed up in the, in, in, in the events that happened. Jesus of Nazareth, was in complete control of what happened to him as he walked into the Romans' hands. And, and, and so he said, happy are you if you do them. This is the book of Jesus' glory. This is the insight into our, into our God that people who are on the outside don't get. The four time markers that are at the beginning of chapter 13, there's no more time markers in John's gospel until the Romans kept come to get him except one. It's in this chapter. It's when Judas betrays him, they say it, and it was the night. It's, you wanted to understand that if you walk out now, it will be night for you, not the day, not the light, not the creation power of God. It will be outer darkness. 
And so I encourage you as a congregation to read through John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Because what he does is he kind of just suspends his words in the air like they're eternal. He suspends those words in the air like they're everlasting. And he invites you in where he has hidden himself to sit at his feet and talk about what the world should be for those who follow him. What it's like to be around someone who would give everything to have you. I like to talk. I like to talk long. I like to keep speaking until I see somebody raise their hand and go, I finally get it. But I'll stop talking now. But I just want to ask one question. Have you grasped the profundity of what Jesus of Nazareth has done for you? That the washing of his feet wasn't just an example. It's truly who our God is. And we who have been made in his image are asked for eternal happiness and glory to imitate this, his example by having our hearts changed and made new by the sacrifice of his blood on the cross. Father in heaven, it's a terrible thing to stand before such a savior. He asks so little of those who don't follow him, but those who do, he asks everything. Father, may the one who gave everything to us give us the strength and courage and power to give everything back to you. For your glory has been revealed to us in your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.